rice, the staple food of all Asia and part of the Pacific, nourishes half of the world's population. This tasty, versatile cereal crop has, over millennia, transcended its role as a fundamental element of everyday nutrition to that of miraculous sustainer of life amid the deprivations of wars and natural disasters. Its ethos of survival, health, fertility, and profound human emotion elevates rice to a level far beyond that of merely food. Hong Kong, a scintillating cosmopolis, is a showcase for the legendary success stories on which modern Chinese commerce was built. This executive comes to the entrance of Hong Kong's Kerry Center each morning to greet the arrival of a highly esteemed business magnate and investor. Although few might recognize this elderly gent, he is celebrated in the Chinese community as dynamic originator of a multifaceted business empire that includes such famous brands as Kerry Holdings, Shangri-La Hotels, and Arowana Commodities. Now almost 100 years old, Mr. Robert Kuok is among Hong Kong's top business elite having witnessed the extraordinary course of China's modern grain trade in Southeast Asia. <laughs> Mr. Kuo has agreed to take part in the Journey of Rice documentary. This is the first time this enigmatic tycoon has ever appeared in any such program. Recounting the history of his father's struggles stirs strong emotions in Robert Kuok. After leaving his hometown of Fuzhou for Malaysia 100 years ago, his father supported the family in the same way that most overseas Chinese had always done, by growing and selling rice. Tamanichu after setting up their own company, the Kuok brothers had cash flow problems. 
，这个房子是我们的，这个房子很很窄，啊，那么这个是另外一条街，这个我父亲母亲。Around then, the Chinese immigrant-founded Chinese Mutual Aid Association appeared in Southeast Asia. Its help powered the family to launch their rice business. So our clothes are made in Singapore by Chinese immigrants. About 100% are Chinese. Most are Vietnamese immigrants. 潮州人，呃，我就和他们做朋友，以后就呃一周也到新加坡三五次，呃，就和他们呃来往，呃，向他们买他们泰国的米啊，缅甸的米啊，这样。Robert Kuo. Was among the many who made a living from the rice trade between China and Southeast Asia, that started in the late 19th to early 20th century. In mid-April each year, Guo Jianping attends the farmers' market in Ubon, Ratchathani, Thailand. To buy and import, without delay, the cream of the newly harvested crop back to China. Thailand, we also often come here for a few times. Mainly for our product, its quality. The quality is definitely the problem. Ubon Ratchathani. Located in northeastern Thailand, occupies 49% of Thailand's farmland. Its fertile soil, high temperatures, and frequent rain make it one of Southeast Asia's leading rice producers. We are in the forest. We are in the forest. They are in the forest. 每年他如果去外地做工什么，等到耕种的时候，他一定要回来。对。这个日期可能有生产，呃，有有年没日，或者有日没年。你这个，因为他这个。种起来的时候，你那个合口的时候，放在这里不可以，不可以，不可以。知道这里不这里就是这里啊。这个如果是说，我我提供一些合理的建议，然后你们不能改进，或者能做，然后你们不做，或者拒绝做，你知道咱们能谈得了感情吗？能做得了朋友吗？做不了嘛，对不对？接受我们这些意见嘛，每次都接受，但是在改进的过程中，有时候还不不解。你你你你你你看看多久时间把这个冷库看看有什么样的方法。说你讲的不是不知道，嗯，大家知道都是在改进中。Duan Lian Qi is a second generation, and Chen Zhen Hui a third generation Chinese, born here in Ubon Ratchathani. They often wrangle with Guo Jianping over rice quality. 我不管怎么样，就是在明年的四月份之前。这个库必须要改进好。这是两六年。Zhuang Lianqi and Chen Zhenhui typify descendants of Chinese migrants from centuries ago. Back then, thousands of Chinese people went to Southeast Asia to earn a living. Sticking to what they knew, migrants chose rice as a livelihood.
Today, rising economic levels have made quality requirements, long a paramount issue in the trade between China and Thailand, even more stringent in the Chinese rice market. Mm. As rice is the staple food in Asia, one would think rice planting, farming, and trading would be plain sailing. But it isn't that simple. The pursuit of profit being the essence of commerce, it was once possible to boost rice trade profits through substandard products. But during this period, the influence of a special person came to the fore of Robert Kuok's commercial life. Robert Kwok's mother, Tang Kak Ji, his lifelong role model, Although she passed away long ago, her image and teachings remain impressed on his consciousness. By the mid-20th century, Southeast Asian economies had rocketed. Poultry rice business profits and his mother's admonitions guided Robert Kwok's decision to try multiple industries. His solid grain and oil industry foundations and innate perseverance brought him success in shipping, real estate, hotels, and other industries. Once known as the Sugar King of Asia, Robert Kwok, now almost a hundred years old, still goes to work every day. Mm. But it doesn't mean the way, yeah? Mm. This one, ho, ho, too strong, you get me? Mm. Send this to Kwong, yeah? Mm -hmm. Send this one number, yeah. But ask her to talk to me, yeah? The rites of Zhou, compiled 2,000 years ago, tell of Southeast Asian peoples, such as in Vietnam, who did not eat granular foods. This implies an absence of scale grain production at that time. So where did the rice so widely cultivated in Southeast Asia today come from? The adjacent Yunnan Guizhou Plateau might well be its source. Your 
这个命也好，或者是啊责任也好，甚至是老祖宗以前规定下来，必须让。这个咱们家这么一直传承下去，世世代代传承下去。About four thousand years ago, intertribal wars forced many ethnic minorities living in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River to migrate. Rice cultivation and farming techniques so spread to China's southwestern Yunnan Guizhou Plateau. Planting and harvesting rice was impossible during the migration. So, as well as packing and transporting rice seeds. The Miao people also needed to preserve cooked rice in transportable form. The pounding of rice to make glutinous rice cakes echoes through the valley on the morning of every festival. Molding it into sweet, fragrant, glutinous rice cakes that were then dried and hardened, preserved it long enough to sustain folk on long journeys. It ensured the Miao people's survival. The historical epoch of 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. Is imprinted on the collective Miao memory. Legend tells of the defeat of Chu Yu, the common Miao ancestor, at the hands of Han leaders, which triggered the millennia-long Miao migration. Southwest China's towering mountains and precipitous ridges stopped the spread of war. But its dearth of arable land also ruled out rice planting. There seemed to be no hope of germinating the transported rice seeds on such mountainous terrain. But human creativity and the desire to eat rice bridged myriad, seemingly insurmountable gullies. Just before the spring sowing in Ailao Mountains of Yunnan Province, a Hani man called Gao Na Jiao and his water buffalo make their daily steep climb to his mountainous rice field. Rugged mountain tracks and primitive farming methods consume most of his daily energy. After cooling in the Ailao Mountains, water vapor from the Red River Valley forms a dense fog that lingers for six or more months. 
It brings the Hani people abundant rain and moisture sufficient to cultivate rice in this otherwise unsuitable mountainous setting. A thousand years ago, like the Miao people, the Han Ni began their migration due to war and ended up in the Ai Lao Mountains. Dozens of generations of Han Ni people carved out these terraces and laid stone and clay ridges until, thanks to backbreaking labor, rice eventually took root and sprouted there. Today, Gao Na Jiu's family celebrates the new rice festival. In September, when the rice ripens, each Han Ni householder goes to the paddy field to pick the plants with the longest ears and largest grains, which he binds and brings home. When the new rice festival ends, the Han Ni start their mass harvest. Migrant ethnic groups seldom select their natural environment, but do choose which food crops to grow. Under the same farming conditions, rice tends to show a larger yield. So, as reaping the optimum amount of food is vital for the community to thrive and prosper, the people stick with rice. Recent archaeological findings show that Chinese cultivated rice reached the Malay Peninsula millennia ago. Some even hold that Southeast Asian rice farming originated in China. No one can verify this, but a broader perspective reveals a wide distribution of rice terraces throughout Southwest China and South Asia. This implies the understanding Asian people gained of the characteristics of rice and their explorations of different farming techniques in order to adapt to the topography of different regions. But the southward spread of rice cultivation was not always so arduous. Thai farmers were blessed with rich soil and ample water. The Mekong River, flowing through six countries, including China, gave easy access in earlier times to the migrations and interactions of Southeast Asian communities. And the lower Mekong fertile alluvial plain is a rice planter's paradise.
Wing Chai, a Thai farmer born in Ubon Ratchet Thani, recently took up Thai boxing and practiced regularly at the gym. Thai boxers use both their hands and feet. Fast and fierce, it takes them only a few rounds to knock down an opponent. But finding the sport didn't suit his peaceful disposition. After a few weeks, the young farmer gave it up. The ruthless ferocity of Thai boxing may indeed conflict with a gentle character. But Thai farmers do tend to be warm-hearted and easygoing, perhaps due to the way they cultivate the land. The month of May just before the rainy season, is seed sowing time in Uban Ratchathani. Villagers have gathered early to help Wing Chai's families do their sowing before it gets too hot. Most Chinese farmers who work intensively are incredulous at the Thai sowing method of randomly throwing the seeds in the field and leaving them to their own devices. Such primitive agriculture is indeed incredible in the global context of mechanized scientific farming. But this languid approach is the norm for Wing Chai's family. คือตะเกียกาเฮ็ดหน้าเกตัวเฮ็ดหน้าใส่โบราณตอบเทคโนโลยีRice farming here depends on the weather, and the rainy season always arrives on time. The tropical monsoon from May to September accommodates the farming seasons from sowing through to harvest while the fertile land and ample precipitation remove any need to irrigate. So the casually scattered rice seeds, nurtured by natural conditions, germinate and eventually tassel. Although unimpressive in appearance and of low yield, the plants emit a natural, globally irresistible aroma. This is the main source of fragrant Thai rice. 我们很多地方的科学家都试过
การเห็นหน้าแต่เห็นมาแต่ก่อนเป็นแม่เนาะมุ่งกับลูกเช้าหน้าพระนาเกิดมากกับภูมิใจสีพ่อแม่พ่อเห็นหน้าแล้วก็บอกคิดว่าสีถิ่นพื้นที่หน้านี้ไปบังอื่นเช้าหน้าเย็นหน้าเราก็ไปสวนสัตว์ไปสวนสัตว์ไปสวนสัตว์ไปสวนสัตว์ไปสวนสัตว์ไปสวนสัตว์ไปสวนสัตว์ไปสวนสัตว์ If you control petroleum, you control all countries. But if you control food, you control everyone. For rice abundant countries, rice is a special commodity and also strategic material, an important bargaining chip for both national survival and international competition. ก็จะรัฐบาลนี้ก็จะให้ร่วมกันผลิตในลักษณะของแปลงใหญ่ก็คือร่วมกันบริหารจัดการเพื่อให้ได้คุณภาพข้าวออกมาที่ดีลดต้นทุนการผลิตเพิ่มประสิทธิภาพการผลิตรักษาคุณภาพข้าวของสยามคุณภาพนี่ก็น่าจะใน东南亚它这个属于热带环境那么水稻在这些国家它的基本上就是唯一的指标所以这个这个重要性，你毫无疑义的，就是说这些国家稻作是他们粮食安全、是他们国家稳定的一个根本。Amid the transition from food to wealth, human dependence on rice accumulated, and rice slowly transcended its role of mere food to one of more profound significance. Combined with the technology of rice farming itself, Such spiritual insights have created today's colorful rice farming civilization in Asia. The autumn harvest gathered, Manbang village enters the agricultural slack season. But local Dai ethnic doctor Ai Jen Nong's work in the straw-strewn paddy field of gleaning rice shoots sprouting from the harvested stalks has just begun. Although incapable of yielding edible rice, these greenish grains are, for Ai Jen Nong, an essential medicinal ingredient. Grown rice grains with herbs in a bamboo tube to capture the properties of the sweet, soothing rice and phlegm-removing, stomach-strengthening bamboo juice to promote digestion and soothe stomach pain. The Dai tendency to contemplate human interaction with nature is expressed in their continual expansion of the rice crop to therapeutic use. Over history, rice has been an integral ingredient in the processing of various traditional Dai medicines.
Ai Wen Dan has asked Ai Jian Nong to treat his broken arm, hoping for pain relief from a black rice poultice. His ancestors have convinced him of the curative efficacy of this black paste. The use of rice as a prescription ingredient, handed down for millennia, coexists with modern medicine in Dai villages today. These are the Patra leaf scriptures written in the 8th to 14th centuries and preserved at the Shi Shuang Ban Na General Buddhist Temple. Besides sutras, the scriptures also convey knowledge relating to medicine, the calendar, law, and rice culture. This was common practice among religious groups in earlier times. World history reveals the link between primeval beliefs and vital food crops. Profound theories are easily understood and popularized through elaborations on plant cultivation and farming methods. Wheat, for example, is integral to European culture, while in Asia, there exist thousands of subtle correlations between the rice farming and folklore of each country. The Shi Gong Dance is an ancient Zhuang prayer ritual imitating frogs, which the Zhuang people worship for eating rice field pests. But this isn't the only medium. Such prehistoric bronze drums embellished with frog images are widely found in Southeast Asian countries where rice is the staple food. Frog fertility worship is also a prayer for the prosperity from bounteous harvests of offspring. The influence of such primal beliefs, although rare today, lives on in their wake. The bell peals every morning in Sizaket province, Thailand, not to summon monks, but to remind locals of a special moment.
It's early morning at Jingju Temple. Today is special, one of few in the year that offers nuns in China a rare opportunity. Behind the temple is a 20 hectare rice field, ripe for the annual October harvest. Reaping rice is lengthy, arduous work, but presents these nuns with a chance to test their mettle. Wading into this vast golden rice field to perform repetitive labor is the highlight of their year. They must in addition, remain silent throughout, concentrating solely on the rice crop, while experiencing to the full this direct experience of nature. It is a sacred, fleeting moment they all yearn for. At Jingju Temple, Preparing meals and abstaining from meat are fundamental duties. Temple rules and precepts require nuns to be vegetarian and to produce most of what they consume. When their bowls are filled with rice they grow, their practice of Buddhism is forged. So rice growing is an important task. When Buddhism prevailed in the Tang Dynasty, excessive Buddhist monks burdened the state. Famous Zen master Bai Zheng laid down the precept, one day without work, one day without food. Self-cultivation through labor was the abiding belief. Contemplating the meaning of life, whose fountainhead is a nourishment from food, is an eternal proposition. Almost all human civilizations treat food as a god and a source of life that brings understanding of life's meaning. From food to wealth, to the meaning of life, rice is a unique metaphor for real history. Its cultivation, a major achievement of the human agricultural revolution.
From ancestry to the present, almost all ethnic groups to whom rice is a staple food share similar cultural landscapes and national characters. Today, whether we domesticated and made rice our staple diet, or it was rice that used us to spread its species across Asia, is hard to say. What's certain is that now the globalized world is here. The story of rice in Asia is only its beginning.